of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praises, he hears faith. There is a sound I love to hear, as the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room. These have been challenging times, but the body of Christ has proven itself resilient. We've gathered in different ways, in different places, yet stood steadfast as the church. We have found peace in God's promise to never leave us or forsake us. In our separation, we have remained united. In our struggle, we have lived out our faith in the midst of the unknown, we have leaned on the strength of an all-knowing God. Throughout history, the church has thrived in adversity, and this moment is no different. The power of God is unstoppable. His love 
unending, His grace unrelenting, His glory undeniable. Today, no matter where we gather, we remain God's people. Our mission has not changed. Our calling has not been altered. And nothing, absolutely nothing, will ever change that. We are the church, and today we stand resilient. Facebook family, YouTube family, Edge website family, wherever you're watching from, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, we are continuing this week of the series that we've started kind of called Social Faith. Uh, I think that some of us, as we've kind of started this transition to being more on Facebook, more on Instagram, more on Pinterest, more on all these different sites, uh, we, we've kind of, it's, it's led to other things. It's, it's led to us um, kind of having this shift uh, away from being content, you know, uh, it's kind of difficult as we've, as we've made this, um, and maybe some of us weren't content anyway, so it doesn't really matter, I guess, you know, we've, we've kind of been wanting more and desiring more. And, and now that we've been kind of locked down, we definitely want more and we desire more. We are really going to go, I want more time outside. I want more movies. I want more of this. I want Netflix and Hulu and CBS to put more stuff out. I, I, I just, I want, and that's kind of a problem that we kind of are facing as a culture right now. You know, anybody ever heard of a hashtag? You know, uh, and and for a long time, when I was a kid, that was called the pound symbol, right? You know, you would always, you would put in your, you know, put in your telephone number followed by pound or whatever. And that's kind of how you ended a pager message. You used to hit pound and that was what was going to be sent. But now we call that a hashtag. I don't know why, but it happened. And it's a tool used in social media, right? And so, like, we could do hashtag EdgeCC. We're ordering some new shirts that say hashtag on the edge together. So those are kind of coming along. And sometimes those hashtags are too long or sometimes hashtag Mike, you're too long on this. It could be one of those things. And, I, and what I want you to know is that social media has some advantages, but I think it has more downsides than it does that it has advantages. See, I think that social media causes us to lose our intimacy. I think that it just even as we're watching this now, so I mean, just give you a kind of a for instance, you watch this now on Facebook, on YouTube, it's a different intimacy than sitting in this new building, right? It's different. It's going to be a different facility. It's going to be a different feel. You don't feel my passion. You just see it on TV. It doesn't, it, it's not like watching a two hour movie and then see an old yeller being shot. You know, we don't, it's a different intimacy. It's, you know, even if there's a movement, it just, it changes things. See, the more we engage in tech, the less we connect as people. And, and see, God designed us to connect as people. He designed us to be intimate with one another, to share things, to love. And see, the more that we connect with tech, the more that we become afraid to talk. I, I, my daughter, who's 14 years old, she struggles just to carry a conversation. She struggles because she's afraid of saying the wrong thing, but she grew up in this social media age. See, we, we forget that there's this, like, this illusion that we're connected to people online when we're really not. See, we believe and we fall victim to this illusion that we have this companionship without the demands of friendship. And, and see, that's where we have to have this shift. And this is the reason why we're kind of doing this series called Social Faith. And so we can start sharing our faith and start building this intimacy as we're online, as we're doing some things. But I think that we need to have some shift in how we're doing it. I think for us, some of us, we, are, we have this contentment, you know, uh, or we've lost this contentment. You know, more that we compare 
the less satisfied that we seem to be. See, some believe that there's never been a bigger problem with contentment right now. You know, if you start to think about it, and I think they're kind of right a little bit. You know, we've never had so much stuff, but yet wanted so much more stuff. We want more, and we want more, and we want more, but we already have so much stuff. Some people blame social media. People blame it with trouble with social media. Some people's lives come out as a highlight reel on social media. They show everything that's so good on there. You'll see a Pinterest mom with her hair all perfect while you're just trying to figure out how to get your hair into a ponytail while dealing with the kids. You know, you have... You see people at you're going to nice restaurants, but yet you're at home having that lean cuisine meal going, this is delicious. And, you know, you see people in other states or you see people going to different places or they got a gym at their house and you're just trying to figure out how to get, how do you even motivate yourself to get off the couch? You, you know, you have these things that are having going on or, or, or you post something and you don't get the likes, the follows, that you don't get any, and, and you just think all of a sudden because you posted somebody and nobody acknowledges it, you think that your life sucks. And that's just kind of what happens. Researchers studied students from two universities and they came out and, they, and they, they studied them on Facebook. And I know that Facebook is kind of a dying medium, right? I know that a lot of people still use Facebook, but it's really for people in their 30s and older. So if you're watching this and you happen to be in your 30s or 40s, uh, just know that you're on a medium that does not cater to a younger generation. That's more of that that Snapchat and that Instagram. They're, they're more there. And uh, so and once you move to that, just trust me, there's the next thing that they're going to be on that you're that you'll be the old people on that medium as well. And so, but at these two researchers, they come out and they, at these two, after looking at these two students, these universities, these students from two universities, they come out and they ask them about their feelings about being on Facebook after being on Facebook. And then more than one third of them significantly felt worse after being on social media. And what they talked about is they, they said envy was the source of these emotions. That they that they envied what people were doing, what they had, what they didn't have, the things that they had, the, the things that they were doing, the places that they were going, all of those things. And so what we need to do for us, we need to have a shift and really kind of expose any of this discontentment so that we can move forward in doing the things that we're called to do online. So one, we need to realize and kind of expose some of the materialistic and the financial envy that we have. We look at other people's cars, we look at their house, we look at their purse, we look at the shoes they got from Zappos, we look at all those different things and we have this envy. And so we have to realize is that one, that God gave you what you're supposed to have right now and maybe he's trying to work to give you more, but we're gonna get to that. Or how about relationally, right? See. Sometimes we'll get on there and relationally we'll start feeling this envious of whatever it is. Maybe maybe we didn't get uh, the invite to that online Zoom party or maybe we didn't get this or maybe we're not married or maybe we don't have time with the kids or maybe we don't have as much fun as other people or we don't have the same followers or we don't have these same things. And then the other thing that we come down to is circumstantials. So what circumstantial things other people are doing or what things that we have. So you might be looking at somebody who you went to school with and you look, they are so far along at this point in their life. Yeah, uh, you know, they have a baby, they have, you know, they, they, whatever it is, they play football, they do this, they do those things. They go to this amazing church and I go to this other church or I do this or I do that. There's whatever the circumstances are that cause us to have this envy. See, Life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of how you respond to it. See, life is only about 10% of what happens to you. But what are you doing with it? We've all heard the antage, if life give you lemons, what are you supposed to do? You make lemonade. Well, well, right now we have a whole bunch of lemons. Why aren't we making lemonade? Why are we sitting there trying to eat these lemons and we got that sour face and we look nasty and, we, and we're upset and we're blaming people? Here's what Paul says. Paul says in Philippians 4, verses 12 and 13, he says, I know what it is to be in need. Right? I'm sure some of us are right there. And he also says, I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, 
whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in, in plenty or in want. And see, here's the big thing. So this next verse gets quoted a lot, but really it's, it, it's kind of quoted out of context, right? Because people will just straight go, oh, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Well, yeah, we can. But this verse is quoted out of context because it actually starts here at this beginning. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I know what it is to, and I've learned the secret of being content. The secret of being content is knowing that God will allow me to do all things. So all those things that other people are doing, I can do as well. It's a matter of how I respond to what he's given to me here. We have to, so I want you to understand something. We have to have this shift in perspective and see, you will always battle with, dis- with discontentment until you allow Christ to be all that you need. Are you allowing Christ to be all that you need? Are you going, that's why I think that fasting is so important sometimes. When we fast, because we, we step back and we go, I, I believe that God's going to nourish and God's going to give to me and God's going to provide. But we don't act that way all the time. We only do that during this fasting. We should be doing it all the time. We should be going, God, I believe that you're going to provide, you're going to give to me, you're going to take care of this. Through Christ's strength, we will kill comparisons. How about that? Through Christ's strength, we will kill comparisons. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians 10, 12. It says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. We don't compare ourselves to people who comp- who, who sit there and commend themselves. We don't compare ourselves to people who are going, man, Mike, you're doing amazing. Dude, you're doing awesome. You, we, that's not what we do. And when they measure themselves by themselves and they compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. This is what scripture tells us, that when we compare ourselves to people who think they've got it all like that, then we're not wise. Anybody who's walking around going, I am amazing, popping their collar, thinking they've got everything all together. Bible tells us they are not wise. Why are we comparing ourselves to them? We have to have this shift here. And, and here's the opposite end of this is. It says, but if you, if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly. It is unspiritual and it's demonic. For where you will have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil practice. That's James 3, 14 through 16. Think about this. Is that as we envy, we are starting to create this, this earthly, unspiritual, and demonic attitude towards things. When we envy it, when we're chasing after it, when we're, when we're pursuing it, and it says this wisdom does not come from heaven. As we have this as we have this, this sense of comparison, because that's what we're doing when we harbor this bitter envy, when we look at it and go, I want this, and I hate them for having it, then we start to have this mindset of going, well, I'm, I'm, I'm holding, it's a demonic mindset. What do we do about it? Number one, even though I know it's hard right now, I think we should take a, sp- a social media spiritual break. We just go on there. And we just go, I'm going to disconnect from it for a while. You know, maybe we hide the feed of people that trigger those type of emotions. You know, all you're going to do is just go to the box, click it, and go hide this person's feed. You don't even have to unfriend them. You can still be friends and not actually see their feed. Stop ordering different magazines and different, uh, and, and, stop, and start deleting shopping apps and start getting rid of things. Stop watching HGTV. Oh, my gosh, because there are so many projects there that they make look easy, but actually take months and weeks and years of work sometimes. We have to do this. And then the other thing is, what would help us tremendously is if we were to start celebrating other people's blessings. When you see somebody who gets something, (laughs) be happy for them. When somebody's marriage is going well, man, be happy for them. Someone else is happy, yes. Be the biggest cheerleader for them. If your friend is vacationing and they are out on the lake and they're doing these things, or maybe they're on a bike, uh, maybe they got, I, I had a conversation with somebody, do you know that they got stuck in New Zealand for three months and had all of their vacation stuff paid for? 
right? Wouldn't it be nice to go to New Zealand, get stuck there for three months and have the government pay for your vacation to be there? Be happy for them, right? Be happy for them. Your friend gets the job that you wanted, be happy for them. Cheer, be their biggest cheerleader. What, what would happen if you were happy for them? And what would happen if you were to bless them through that? What, what changes there? See, being upset by God blessing someone else may be why God isn't blessing you. And see, that's one of those things that we have to be looking at is going, we need to be happy and sharing the joy and, and, and being enthusiastic for God blessing our brothers and sisters. And too often we're not. We, this jealousy and this envy come out of us, and, and, and really what it shows is that we don't have a heart of gratitude. Look at what God, look at what you've already provided for me. Look at what you've given here. And see, what we need to do is we need to cultivate gratitude. We need to have a shift and cultivate gratitude. Here's what it says in Proverbs 15, 15. For the despondent, every day brings trouble. For the happy heart, life is a continual feast. So for those that are that are always, I used to use this analogy every once in a while. See, every day, a vulture goes out looking for death. Every single day, they go out and they look for death. They find it almost every day. But on the opposite end of this, a hummingbird every day goes out looking for something sweet, something beautiful, life-giving nourishment. They both find it each and every day. What are you searching for each and every day? Are you searching for the negativity, the death, the destruction? Or are you searching for the life, the beauty, the, the gift that God gives to us? Which one are we searching for? What are we doing? See, <laughs> Melissa and I took a trip a couple days ago, and we were in the car, and we've taken kind of a little tour of the Bay Area. And... We, we were sitting in traffic. We, we went to different places. We were looking for something. We couldn't find it. And, and through the whole thing at the end of it, we had, it, it was a very long and frustrating day. And here's what Melissa said to me. We were at a conference and somebody said at this conference. And so we've kind of taken it as one of those antages, right? We were going, hey, that's going to be ours now. And so when we sit in the car after being in traffic all day long and, and, and just having a, just a terrible time going from place to place, she looked at me and she said, she's like, well, at least we got to do this together, right? But isn't there a beauty in looking at this and going, it could have been horrible. We sat in traffic. We went through this horrible experience, but we did it together. We got to laugh. We got to talk. We joked. We, we talked about different circumstances. That's the same thing that you, when you get stuck in traffic, you know, maybe you put it on Caleb and you go, at least I get to spend time with this and listen to, the, to worship and or I get to listen, at least I get to do this. You have to look at what you're pursuing while you're doing it. Are you looking for the death and destruction? Or are you looking for the beauty and the life-giving and the, and the encouragement? What are you looking for every day? You know, um, we had a friend with cancer. And when you would talk to her, she would say, the only thing that has changed is my perspective. It's the only thing that has changed. You, you know, she would go, I know that this time may be coming to an end, but I know where I'm going. I know that the mission, I've been called home. See, there's a difference in perspective. It's not like, oh my gosh, I've got cancer. It's almost got, uh, God's calling me home. There, there's a difference in perspective. See, Solomon, the richest man of his time, maybe of all time, here's what he says. In verse 9 of Ecclesiastes, he comes out and says, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Enjoy what you have. Be happy. Look at what God has given to you. Do you realize that we have so much stuff? And maybe you're watching this and you're sitting, you're homeless. Do you know that you have a lot of stuff being homeless? No matter where you're at in life right now, you have a lot of stuff. You should be thankful for what God has blessed you with. We get to this mindset when you go, I'm tired of my car. I'm tired of this crazy life. I'm, my house is too small. My house is too big. It's, I, I don't like my job. I love my job. I hate the, the, my boss. I, whatever it is, the, my, the church that I attend is, hey, I wish they would do more. I wish the church I attended would do less. I wish they would focus on this. I wish they would focus on that. You see, these are all the things that you see all day long as we're watching on Facebook. Let me go back to Philippians 4. 
I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. See, through Christ's power, we can kill we can kill comparison and we can cultivate gratitude. We have to make that choice, though. We have to make that decision. We have to go, this is the direction I'm going to go. What sort of mindset are we going to have? Are we going to pursue the death, the destruction, or are we going to pursue life and, and joy and happiness and to be happy for others and to be, to be happy for seeing God bless others and to, and to share in our brothers and sisters in their joy and to go, God, you're doing something amazing? What are we going to go? Ah, oh, I'm just going to be so negative. See, we got to stop being professional complainers. And we have to be content and go, God, look at what you've done. Look at what you've created. Look at what you've given me. Look at how you continue to bless me. God, thank you. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for, thank you for giving us this opportunity to be content in each and every situation that you give to us. We have to make that choice. We have to make that decision. We have to pursue to see, we have to make the decision to see the good in it or to see the negative in it. And Father, we ask that you give us the strength and the courage to continue to see the good. That's what we want to see. We want to see the beauty in the things that you've created. And we want to see the beauty and and you blessing others. We want to see the beauty in you doing something new and miraculous and wonderful. Father. Help us take a break from social media, whatever that looks like, whether that's just uh, unfriending some negative people or, or blocking their feed or us actually completely disconnecting for a while so that we can reset and, and see what you have in store for us. Father, allow us to have the strength when people go, why are you doing that, especially in this time of pandemic, where that's where we're getting all of this news. That's probably not real news. So, Father, give us strength. Help us be encouragers. Help us be be those that continue to breathe life and speak life to all those around us. It's in your son, Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So, guys, I want to I want to let you know is that uh, through this last week, we've had some tremendous progress in our building. And uh, we will be in here soon. So as you're starting to see, there's things that are happening in our government. There's cases that are starting to change. There's, you know, there's, there's things that are going on. And we tell you that we'll be in our building soon. I'm not going to give a specific date because I don't have that yet. But we'll be here soon. So I want you to know that we're making progress, uh, that, uh, uh, that things are moving along and chugging along. And we want to continue to ask for your support, not only just uh, in prayer, but that you continue to support the edge is that we will uh, we will have this beautiful facility within uh, let's just say about six weeks. That's just a guess. Don't hold me to that. But that's where we're about. Anyway, so if you want to come take a look, we would love to show you. If you want to come and help out, uh, we're not quite ready for that yet. But we will have some projects that are coming up here very soon that you can help out with. So. Um, uh, one thing that we do are, and we are looking for is that uh, we are looking for some people who are willing to come pray, uh, especially as we're building walls. We're looking for people that have, maybe if you have an encouraging verse or if you have a verse that you would like to have built into the walls of this facility, we would love to have that as well so that we can add those and maybe have you come put them on the inside of the walls, add a Bible, highlight that verse. We, those are things that we would love to have happen. And uh, we want you to be part of that. So please, please, please reach out. Please let us know. Comment on, uh, I wouldn't comment on Facebook because we're not really there much. So uh, if you're watching this on our live feed, comment there. If you're watching on YouTube, comment there. If you're on Facebook, somebody will see it. It's just a matter of when. So anyway, uh, we love you. We can't wait to spend time with you and see you again and uh, to do church on the edge together. Can't wait to see you. Bye.